I think all we have to do is get out of his way. Many times what we want to do, we want to try to fix it ourselves. The song said, Lord, Lord, you do it for me. I know many of us are going through trials, tribulations, things are not going the way that we want it to be. But we have a God that we have direct access to through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we can ask him to do what he does. He'll fix it. He'll take care of it. He will bring you through. At this time, we will have children's church. I know as I get into this, I might forget. So let's have all the children between the ages of 3 and 12. If you can meet the teachers, meet Bridget over by the door. It's time for children's church. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for all that you have done, all that you're doing, and all that you're going to do for us, Father. Father, I pray that you allow us to get out of your way and allow us to use that direct access that we have to, through, to you through your son, Jesus Christ, Father. I pray that you allow me to stand behind this message and people see you as this, this sermon is preached, Father. Father, fill me up that others will be filled and they will hear this word and know that it's through your son Jesus that we have salvation and we have we are delivered. And it's through his name, Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Amen. I just want to thank everyone who has who have uh, just come out today. I know it's I know it's hard for us uh, with all the things that are going on. In our lives, especially I know today, uh, it was hard for me to get up because I don't know if I'm getting older or whatever, but that springing forward, oh my goodness, it is disrespectful. It's disrespectful to my, my rest. It's disrespectful to my, my preparation. Everything is just, it's, you're right, it's disrespectful. But I know last night, it seemed like the, the last night went by so quickly. I did not want to get up, but each and every one of us got up this morning. We made it here. And I just thank you, whether you're a new member, whether you're a visitor, whether you've been here for years and years. I just thank you from the bottom of my heart that you took the time to spend today, today, um, at Peace Baptist, hearing the word of God. And if you are uh, a new member, or not even a new member, if you are visiting uh, we have ushers, we have first touch that we do not want you to leave out of here without us connecting with you. We just want to continue to be that contagious Christian community that loves you to Christ. So if, if, uh, if you are new, if you are visiting, we'll give you a card that we just want to continue just to, you know, uh, just to search and seek after you. Um, I know I do want to preface, I know there are a lot of things been going on, a lot of things going on in each and every one of our lives. I tell you, last week, last week, uh, normally I don't look at my phone right before I'm going to preach, but I just happened to look at the phone, and 
if you noticed last week, I was very distracted. I had just a troubling text. And when I got up here to preach, it, it, I just could not stay focused. You know, things are going on. You know, um, uh, situations are going on. And I just could not find myself focused. And as I went through the sermon, I listened to it on Monday. I don't even remember and know how I even made it through. I know how I made it through. The Lord, he uh, allowed me to be able to get through that um, sermon. And, you know, there's just a lot of things going on, just trials and tribulations. I, I should have realized when uh, uh, Elder Tony Bates got up, and then I know my voice was all struggling and cracking. I'm thinking he's going to uh, uh, give me some water. But I didn't realize that Shirley had told him to, stop the sermon, go up and stop the sermon and pray for him. He needs prayer because she realized I was just distracted. And I realized I was distracted because on Psalms 23, I could not remember Psalms 23. I know Psalms 23, the back of my hand. I mean, I know it in my sleep. And I was up here. I could not get it out. And Tony, you know, I talked to him later and you know, he was like, I just cannot get up and stop your sermon. And because and, I would have been like taken aback. But you know what? I should have stopped the sermon and just had you all just pray for me. Because prayer works. We have a direct access to our Lord and Savior, to our God, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And continue to pray for me, pray for my family. And also, just, you know, we just should just have a habit and it just be common that we pray for one another. But I know that God put me here for a purpose. And I know my purpose last week was to get through that message. No matter what's going on in your life, in season and out of season, he has us on purpose. And he and we have to trust that he's going to provide for us. And he provided. The word got out. It did not go out in vain. It was not void. And I just want to let you know that in season, out of season, what I'm going to do is make sure that I'm following him. I'm trusting in him. And that's what he wants us to do because we, we all want that peace. We all search for peace. We want it. We want peace for ourselves. We want peace for our family. We want peace for our church. We want peace for our nation. We want peace from the world. We all want peace. Throughout our lives, every aspect of our lives, no matter what age you are, we want peace. As we're, li- li- as we're living, and also we want peace. We wanted to say it on our tombstone. We, we want to say R.I.P., rest in peace. But we know that Jesus, he came. He came for our peace. It says in um, uh, Colossians chapter uh, 1, it says that Jesus, having made peace through the blood of his cross, that he was reconciled unto us. Jesus, he came for our peace, but we know that even during his lifetime, that he experienced trials. He, in his last, the last uh, 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 books of John, we experience, we see how Jesus, he was stressed. He had his pressure, there was questions. Even with him, the, 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 the disciples were going through a lot. They were going through a lot of stress. Jesus, in chapters 13 through 16, had to teach them, teach them about humility. Because they were arguing about who's going to be the greatest. So Jesus had to pull aside his apron and wash, his, wash their feet. Jesus had to tell them about the peace that he's going to bring to them. He told them in chapter 14 that they do not let your hearts be troubled. And he goes and tells them that he's going to prepare a place for them. But also through that chapter, he tells them that he's going to provide peace for them. That peace. And then in chapter 15, he talks about how we should, how they should abide in him as he abided in, 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 in his father. Then he goes on in chapter 16, and he once again, he talks to his disciples because he knew that he was going to lead them. He's going to be leaving them in the next few hours. And he talks to his disciples and tells them that I am going to send you an advocate. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit who is going to bring peace to you. And he's going to bring in remembrance of the word that when you go through all these trials and tribulations, that you'll have a helper. And the last teaching that Jesus did 
public teaching that he did to his, his disciples was in John 16, He says, as I have spoken these words to you, he said that I will give you peace. The world is going to give you tribulation. But, I, but he said, be of good cheer because I have conquered or overcome the world. We want the peace, but we have to abide in him. And then what Jesus goes on and does, and this is where we're going to be going today. We are starting a new sermon series. This is, uh, uh, we're on the eve of Resurrection Sunday. The last Sunday of this month is Resurrection Sunday. And we're going to next, next few weeks, we're going to be talking about how Jesus is the Lamb of God. He's the Lamb of God. He's a sacrificial lamb that was used to allow us to have that connection, that reconnection, that fellowship with God. And, and uh, we'll be coming out of John chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. John 17, verses 1 through 5. When you get to John chapter 17, verses 1 through 5, please stand as we read the word of God. Thank you. John 17, verses 1 through 5, it reads as follows. It says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they, know, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given to me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with, with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world, world was. Amen. May God bless the hearers, the doers. Of his word. <clears throat> the title of this sermon that God has given me in this new sermon series, The Lamb of God, is The Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer. Many of us know, but many people might not know, that some people might think that Matthew, in Matthew 6, that that's the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13, it talks about, you know, this is the Lord's Prayer. But we know that wasn't the Lord's Prayer. You know, the, the disciples were asking Jesus how to pray. And Jesus gave them a model on how to pray. But, but we get it confused that this is the Lord's Prayer. Jesus, no way Jesus could have pr uh, prayed that prayer. Even though Jesus, the son of man, he prayed a lot. Throughout scripture, we'll see that he prayed a lot. But the Lord's prayer is in chapter 17 of John. But, but we think that it's Matthew 6. And the reason why there's no way Jesus could have ever prayed Matthew 6, when you get to forgive us our debts or forgive us our trespasses, Jesus could never pray that because I thought that Jesus was sinless. I thought that Jesus was perfect. There's no way Jesus could have prayed, forgive me my trespasses. He never sinned. See, it was our prayer. See, Matthew 6 should be called the disciples' prayer. It's not Jesus' prayer. He never prayed that. He couldn't pray that. And, and, and we see that in this Chapter, chapter 17, this chapter is truly, the whole chapter is Jesus praying. It's the Lord's prayer. And it's broken up into, into three categories. Whereas the first five verses that we just wrote, uh, uh, read is Jesus praying for himself. In verses 6 through 19, we see Jesus praying for his disciples. And then in, in uh, 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 verses 20 through 26, he's praying for each and every one of us. He's praying for believers. And that's us. I don't know if, if, if you ever had anybody praying for you. You, you might have had a praying mother, grandmother, a father, grandfather. 
But I'm here to tell you that if you have not had anyone pray for you, you have Jesus Christ who is praying for you. That, that he was praying for you, he is praying for you. The last few verses of this chapter is Jesus praying for you. You see, Jesus, he was put on a cross. We know that. Jesus was put in a grave. Jesus, he rose from that grave. He ascended to heaven, and he is not just sitting there doing nothing. He is sitting on the right hand of God, interceding for your prayers. He is praying for you. And if you are a child of God, you have Jesus Christ who is praying for you. That's what this is telling us. And, 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 and these uh, uh, verses, these first five verses, it, they are so rich. I mean, you can spend a whole lifetime in this whole chapter because this, this is the Lord's prayer. But these first five verses, there's a lot in it. And Jesus he is, he is praying, he's glorifying salvation. It's about salvation. And in here, he, he, there's five glories that Jesus is praying about. He's glorifying, he's glorifying his sacrificial death. He's glorifying the Father's redemptive plan. He's glorifying his obedient life. He's glorifying his victorious resurrection, and finally he's glorifying his exalting divinity. See, it's about salvation. And we just sung a song about how, you know, the, the Lord can do it. You see, salvation is something that is completely, is completely God's initiative, is completely in God's power. Only God can give you salvation. And Jesus is going to spell this out. It's not by man's doing. It's only by God. God is the only one that can give you salvation. And when, you, when, you, when it comes to salvation, if we look at man, if we look at man, when it, I'm talking about salvation. When we look at man, we get what man can do, which is nothing. See, when we talk about salvation, if we look at what God can do, when we look at what God can do, we know God can do everything. God can do all things. And Jesus even said it. Jesus said it. He says, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Now, it's true that, you know, in some people's hands, they can do a lot of things. They've, they've done good things in some people's hands. But we know in God, when it comes to salvation, it cannot be put into anybody else's hands. Like there's some people throughout history that in their hands, they have done some good things. Like when you look at Phyllis Wheatley, Phyllis Wheatley can write a poem on a worthless piece of paper. And, and she can make that poem worth $6,000. You see, that's genius. You see, Michael Jordan... Michael Jordan can write his name on a basketball, and that basketball can be worth millions. You see, that's capital. You see, Uncle Sam, even Uncle Sam can, can take a piece of paper, put a stamp on it, and make that worthless piece of paper worth $100. You see, that is money. And then we have Basquiat. Basquiat, I probably, I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong, but he's an artist. You see, Basquiat can, can take a worthless piece of canvas and he can draw a picture on it and make it worth over $6,000. You see, that is art. You can even have someone who's common, like a, like a mechanic. A mechanic can take a material that's worth $5 and he can uh, uh, make that material make it into where it can start something and make it worth $50, you see, that is skill. But when it comes to God, when it comes to salvation, you see, God can take a worthless life. He can take a sinful life and he can uh, 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 use the blood of Jesus and he can put, that, put the Holy Spirit in that person and that person can be a blessing to humanity. That is salvation. Only God 
can, 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 can give you salvation. It's not through anyone else. That's why salvation is, is, is about God's grace. E- 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 Ephesians 2, 8 tells us that it is by the grace of God through your faith that you are saved. It's, it's through only God can give you salvation. And now we see Jesus. Jesus is, is now praying. He, could, he, he left his disciples with this one verse that says that you are going to go through tribulation and I'm going to give you peace so be of good cheer because I have conquered or overcome the world. That was verse 33 of chapter 16, the last verse. His last teaching words to his, his disciples. But because Jesus is a praying son of man, he goes into prayer. And he's praying with his disciples to God. And this first verse, this first verse of chapter 17 is a deep verse. I mean, there's so much in verse 1 of chapter 17. It says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son and your son also may glorify you. There's so much. And I really, I want you to keep your Bible open because we'll go through these first five Five verses. It's so much in it, especially in chapter one. I mean, verse one, that Jesus had already spoken these words. The words that he spoke was what I just told you. You know, he's in the upper room, and this is Jesus' last few hours, last few hours on this earth before he is going to experience a horrifying death. And and then he he lifted. He says that he lifted his eyes up to heaven. You see, Jesus was in a uh, a customary praying position. He lifted up his eyes and put his hands in the air. Now, when we pray, we pray with our head down, you know, folding, folding our hands. It doesn't matter how you pray. This is saying how Jesus prayed. He lifted up his eyes. It kind of reminds you of Psalms uh, 123 verse 1. It says, I lift up my eyes to you, to you who sit enthroned in heaven. He, he knew where he came from. He came from heaven. He came from the right hand of God. So he lifted up his eyes to God. And the first thing he says, Father, the hour has come. See, Jesus is praying to his father. But what he said, because many times in the word he was saying the hour is not here or the hour is coming. Now he says the hour has come. He's praying for his death. If you realize what that hour was, the hour was was him being being put on a cross. He said the hour has come. He's praying for his death. This is what he's praying. And many of us, we look past that. But he's, he's already said, you know what? I've already served. I've already completed what God had already put me here for. He says, the hour is here now. I've already, I'm, I'm ready to die. He, he's already showing. He's already showing the glory of God. You see, many of us, when, when we pray, you see, because Jesus can say that. Jesus can say, the hour has come, I'm ready to, to die, because Jesus sees God in everything. He sees him in everything. He knew God was going to be in the uh, death. But see, when we pray, we pray, we, we, we kind of pray to where, to where we want to conform God's will to our agenda. You see, that's how we pray. We want to conform his will to our agenda. Oh, I'm in this situation, God. Okay, now, now make your will become my agenda. Whereas we just sung that God's going to do it. We need to get out the way. But see, Jesus, he flips it. Jesus prays that his will will be conformed to God's will. See, how many of you pray that your will will be conformed to God's will. That's what Jesus is praying. He's saying the hour has come. And we know that in, in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 3, it says that, that there is a time for everything. And Jesus is realizing there's a time for me to die. Now is the time for me to die. And uh, in uh, Hebrews chapter uh, uh, 9, it says it is appointed uh, upon men once to die, but after that is judgment. You see, we, have, we are all created. We are all created for eternity. We are all created to live eternally. Even in the nine months that you were in your mama's womb, that was just transition. 
to where you're going to be born. And then even the, the three scores in 70, I mean, uh, 20, I'm sorry, three scores in 10. I'm sorry. So 70 years, most, of, most people live 70 years. Now, it's praise God that we have people living longer. But even during that time, once you die, it's transition, it's moving day. It's not the, the, the end. There's a time for you to be saved. And the only time that you can be saved is in, is, is in between your birth and your death. No one can stand here or sit here and say, well, I wanted to be saved, but I just couldn't. I didn't have time. You have time between your birth and your death to be saved. There's only one time. You can't wait till the end. We we saw that in Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, I think it starts in verse 19 where uh, there was a rich man. It's talking about a rich man and a man named Lazarus. Lazarus was a person who was... uh, 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 tormented. He had sores everywhere. He was poor, but this rich man had everything. He had the clothes. He had the possessions. He had the money. And Lazarus just wanted to eat off this rich man's plate, j- j- just the crumbs. And it says that, that, that Lazarus was eaten, and he was so tormented that even dogs were licking off his sores. But then it says that both of them died. Lazarus and that rich man died. Now, I can imagine the rich man probably had a, a really nice homegoing service. Probably a really nice casket, probably the limousine, the caskets. The church is probably filled, you know, family members, people mourning. He probably had, he's probably dressed in really nice clothes or whatever. But it says, it says in Luke chapter 16 that when this man died, that he went to hell. And then it goes on and talks about how he looks up. And he sees that, the, that Lazarus was in the arm of Abraham, and he was telling Abraham to have Lazarus dip, dip his toe so he can uh, 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 not be tormented by the fire in his tongue. You see, that man, that rich man, went to hell because he was not saved. You see, you, you can't wait till you die to get saved. You have to do it while you're alive. There's a time to be saved. Jesus says the hour has come. He is ready to die. And then he goes on and says, after he says the hour has come, he says, glorify your son that your son may glorify you. Jesus is talking about this mutual glorification between him and his father. Jesus is saying that, look, I know I'm going to die, but whatever I do, no matter what I do, even when it comes to death, you're going to, your glory will be done. To God be the glory. Jesus is already saying that throughout his life, Jesus, is everything that he did, everything he said uh, was always to the glory of God. He's even saying that to death. He said that I want to give you all the glory. And when we talk about glory in the Bible, uh, it's talking about how it applies to God's attributes. It applies to God's characteristics. That's what he, that, the, this is what Jesus is saying. He said, your son, he said, glorify me so I may glorify you. And there's a, 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 a verse in, um, in Psalms 24, verses 8 and 10, how, how were God's attributes and characteristics are, are being explained or examples of in uh psalms 24 verse 8 it says who is this king of glory the lord strong and mighty the lord mighty in battle and then verse 10 it says who is this king of glory the lord of hosts he is the king of glory you see you see we even in churches churches today we have to realize that it's all about god's glory. We give God the glory. But many churches, we try to please others. We try to do things to make others' worship service more pleasing, more acceptable, more so-called exciting. But when we come here, when we come here today, when we come here on Sunday, when we have worship service, service, everything should be to God's glory. We should be lifting him up in glory. It's all all pointing to him. And this is what Jesus is trying to get us to to, uh, to say that he wants to be glorified just like his father. 
And we know that he was. Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that. It says that he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus, he wants to be glorified with his father. And in verse 2, verse 2, it says, As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. This authority. Jesus has been given all authority. We know John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God. And the word was with God. And then it says in verse 3, it says, all things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made. You see, Jesus was given authority over everything. Jesus has all power in his hand. And even in his death and his resurrection, it's all bringing power and glory to God. God gave him, even as a baby, all power or authority over all flesh over everything jesus was given that and jesus and when it comes to salvation the only way that we can even be saved be delivered is through jesus christ he's the only one that can bring us to salvation he's the only one that can deliver us and it and 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 god is going to make sure that his son jesus christ it's going to get all the glory because it points right to him. And Paul even goes and tells us this in, 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 a, in a Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. It says, therefore, God also has highly exalted him. Who is him? Jesus Christ. And he has given him the name which is above every name. And it goes on and says that, that the name of Jesus, every, in the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. For those who are in heaven and those who are on earth, and it says that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Jesus has been given all power, all authority. And when you look at John, you'll see that, that God, God gave Jesus all that authority. And, we'll, and, uh, and we can look and dive deep and, and, and see that giving in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the book of John, giving, the word giving, is just as important as faith and believing. The word giving, God gave. One of the most uh, uh, popular verses in the Bible, John 3, 16, that God so loved the world. He what? He gave his only begotten son. And in and, 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 uh, uh, John 6, 44, it says that no one, no one can come to Jesus and receive the gift of God who gives, giving, God, he gave us everything. Giving is important, and he gave Jesus all power. And that power that we are talking about, he, he goes on in verse um, uh, 3 and says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. God gave us Jesus. It says, it says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever will believe will not perish. What this is telling us, because it says that he gave, he gave us eternal life. He says that we'll not perish and have e e eternal life. What this is telling me is that there are two groups. There are two groups of, of, uh, of uh, people out here. There are the whosoever wills and the whosoever will not. If you are a whosoever will, you are fortunate because you will have believed in Jesus Christ, accepted Jesus Christ, and you'll have eternal life. So, so he's telling us that there's two groups of people out here. And there will never be a single soul. Once again, I said that earlier. There will never be a soul who would say, I I, I had the opportunity or I wanted to be saved, but I couldn't. Because Jesus goes on and says, whosoever will, let him come freely. Let him come and drink of this water, this living water. You have a free choice. You have an opportunity while you're alive to be the whosoever will. 
Because many of us think the ultimate, the ultimate of salvation, the ultimate benefit of salvation is not going to hell. That's not the ultimate. That, that's one of the benefits. Absolutely. That's one of the benefits. But it's not the ultimate. You see, what this verse says, is, in verse 3 it says, and this is eternal life. That's, is this, that's salvation. And this is salvation, that they may know you. You see, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about uh, 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 the meaning of salvation. The meaning of being delivered is to bring knowledge of God, to bring knowledge to God, knowing of God. And back in, a, uh, uh, back in, in, the, in the Greek words, there were two words that were used for no. We just call no, no, K-N-O-W. But the way that they use it, there, there, were, there, were, there were two types. First, there is this type that's called theoretical knowledge or intuition. And basically what that is, is that you are learning something. It's, it's knowing to learn. You might read something uh, in a book and just pass a test or read something just to know of it. Now, that type of learning, that type of knowledge is not going to change your life. But then the other type of knowledge is knowing by experience, knowing by experience. And this is what uh, 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 John is talking about. He said, this is eternal life that you may know. This is experience, this experiential knowledge in, in the sense of knowing that you have experienced something. It's kind of like an example would be like a speeding ticket, a speeding ticket. Now, y'all know that when you drive down I-75 or 71, that you can't be driving 90 or 95 miles an hour. You know that the theoret theoretically or intuition, you know that you're going to get a ticket if you're driving that fast. That's intuition knowledge. Now, experiential knowledge or experience knowledge is you drive 90 miles an hour, you get pulled over, and now you have to pay a $200, $300, $400 ticket. You see, See, you experienced that, so now you know. You see, this is what John is talking about. He said, this is eternal life, as he says that you may know God. You see, this is what we're talking about, is that these are the people that if you have accepted Jesus Christ, that you know that he is Lord and Savior. It's like you cannot be a child of God and not experience the, the aroma of God or the taste of God. This is what it's saying is that you have this experience, this experience with God that you know that God is good. You know that God is merciful. You know that God is faithful. You know all these things because you experienced it. And a child of God experiences God. He experiences Jesus Christ. And, 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 and Paul goes on in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, in a Philippians three, he says, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the, to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ as Lord. See, it's that experience, it's that exponential knowledge that John is talking about. He's saying e everlasting life, eternal life is that you may know God. You know him for yourself. You have this personal relationship with God. Then he goes on in verse 4. He says, I have glorified you on this earth. I have finished the work which you have given to me to do. It's like Jesus is speaking that he has already completed or already accomplished everything. This is what he said. He said, I have finished the work. Like, it's already done. He says, it's done. Now, he already told them in verse 33 of chapter 16 that I have victory. I have overcome the world. But Jesus is saying, I have finished the work. You see, it was the Father's will that Jesus brings about salvation. And Jesus is already saying, look, it's already done. Take me. Because, you know, in verse 1 he says, the hour has come. I am ready to die. 
There's nothing in this universe that's going to stop Jesus from fulfilling the Father's will. This is what he's saying. And we know that in John 19, when Jesus is on the cross, what's his final words? He said, it is finished. But now we see in John 17, you know, prior to him being on the cross, he says, I have finished. Jesus already said, it is done. It's done. And, and when he was on a cross, he was talking about the redemption for salvation. He was talking about how his blood was going to be the remission of sin. But now when he's in John chapter 17, he's talking about, I have fin-, he said, I have finished. He says that I'm talking about the preparation of these disciples. I'm talking about the preparation of the followers that you have given me, God, because God gave him those followers. He said, I'm talking about the preparation of these disciples. And he goes on, if, if you read uh, 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 the prayer that he has for the, the, for the disciples, in verse 6, he said, I have manifested your name in them. In verse 8, he says, um, I have given them the words that you have given me. In verse 12, he says, I have kept them in your name, those you have given me. He gave him, God gave him those disciples. In verse 18, he said, I sent them into the world. He had already completed everything. He already taught the disciples everything that they needed to be taught. He's already shown them everything that needed to be shown. God, I mean, so Jesus says, I have finished your work. I have finished your work, God. Then he goes on to the, the, the final verse that he's talking about himself. See, because that was his his obedient life. He gave glory to him being obedient to what God told him to do. And then in verse 5, he says, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. You would think that, that Jesus is hours away from going to the cross. Hours away from dying in, in horrific death. And Jesus, he is anticipating being glorified with the Father rather, rather than the pain of the cross. Jesus is not focusing on the humiliation of the cross. He's focusing on the exchange of the glorification with God. He said, he said, oh God, he said, glorify me together with you. He said, together with him, because they are of the same nature. See, Jesus is already showing us that there's a relationship between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He's already talking about the Trinity. He said, glorify me together with you. He said, together, he said, when the foundation of the earth was, was, he said, before the foundation of the earth. He's talking about the Trinity. And we know the Trinity does not mean that we are, uh, uh, that we believe in three gods. It's one God and three persons. They each had their, 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 uh, their purposes. You know, we know that the, the, the Father, he devised the plan for our salvation. We know the Son accomplished the provision for our salvation. We know the Holy Spirit, he brings the person to salvation. It's all about us being reunited, re reconciled with God. And, it, and he's saying, God, he said, Father, he said, glorify me together with you again before the foundation of the earth. Jesus wanted, he, he said, everything that I have done, everything that I'm going to do up until I die and be resurrected is to glorify you. The, the, he, he, he said he, he wasn't even concentrating on the next hours where he's going to be led to the cross. He led to the cross and he let them take him to the cross. Jesus let them nail his hands to the cross, nail his feet to the cross. He let them pierce him. Jesus is saying that, look, the work is already done. I've already completed what you have wanted me to do, and I'm going to complete it to death. And we know that even though Jesus, he died for us, the remission of our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ had to happen, that even when he was put in that grave, we know that three days later, he rose again. We know that he is risen. We know that he is God. We know that he has all power in his hand, that he still is, is praying for each and every one of us. Prayer works. 
I'm here to tell you that if you are a child of God, you have Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, continuing to pray for you no matter what situation you are in. And I can, and this is firsthand experience that I know that God is, he listens to our prayers because I know I am a child of his. I know I can, I can pray to God. I can pray to Jesus Christ that no matter what you are going, that you are putting me through. I know I'm going to overcome. I'm, I'm a testament right now, standing here right now, knowing all the baggage, knowing all the problems that are right behind me, right over me, next to me. I still believe that God has a purpose. God has a plan for my life. And if, and if I know he's taking me through all this and he's allowing me just to preach the word, he just says, open your mouth. I have the words that is going to be able to be brought out. And I know, I'm telling you, that if you are not a child of God, even if you are a child of God, you are going to go through some stuff. But I know I can lay my head on my pillow at night knowing that Jesus Christ is, is hovering over me and he's listening to my prayers. I know that my family is going to be all right because I have a Lord and Savior who promised me that he would never leave me or forsake me. And if you have not experienced that sweet taste, that sweet aroma of Jesus Christ, this is your opportunity. Because you are going to go through something and you need someone who's going to bring you peace. The only one who can bring you peace is Jesus Christ. If you are sitting here and you have not accepted Jesus Christ as that peacemaker, he's the peace in the storm. We are in a storm. And I can just look at him and see the peace that he just provides me and my family. If you have not experienced that, this is your opportunity. This is not about church membership, about Peace Baptist membership. This is a membership to the kingdom of God. If you have not experienced that we have ministers, we have elders, we have deacons, deaconesses, we have leaders of the church that is going to be standing around that they can walk you through this path of salvation. And that path is a path that can only be given by God. Because he gave us his son to make that path possible. If, and you, in order for you to have this eternal life that is, that is eternal life, not eternal damnation, you have to accept Jesus Christ. Is there anyone? Is there anyone? We are all going through something. If you just need prayer. Jesus is praying for you. Not only did he pray for himself, pray for his disciples, but he is praying for you. Is there anyone who needs prayer that, that, that uh, you know that the road is rocky? And guess what? It's going to get rockier. Jesus said that the narrow is the gate, narrow is the path. Broad is the gate, and many people are going to follow that broad path. And that path is going to be easy. The narrow path is going to be hard. But at the end of that path, you have Jesus Christ. No matter what you're going through, at the end, you have Jesus. Is there anyone who just needs prayer to help them realize that, you know what, I know I'm going through it. Jesus, give me the strength. Is there anyone? Is there anyone? No. Just thank you, Lord. 
inhabiting and hearing our prayers. We thank you for being our intercessor that takes our prayers and bring them before the Father, Lord. Thank you for hearing our prayers, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for the message that has just gone out, Lord, uh, because it's the message for all of us, Lord. That prayer that Jesus prayed is a prayer for our salvation. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, because we're not worthy. We're not worthy at all, Lord. We have a minister here that says, I am tore up from the floor up. <laughs> and Lord knows that is true. We don't deserve it, Lord. It's nothing that we've done to deserve salvation. It's only by your grace, Lord. It's only by your mercy, Lord, that you look beyond our faults and you saw to our knees. And you knew that we were all sinners, Lord, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Lord, you chose to love us anyway, Lord, in spite of us, Lord. You have loved us, Lord. What a gift to give your only begotten son that he shed his blood on Calvary, Lord, for me, for you, for all of us, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for who you are. Lord, we just ask for your touch, Lord. Lord, we just ask for your continued mercy. And Lord, we just, we, we don't even have the words. We can't even form the words uh, in our mind to say how great you really are. We, we, there's no words that can express it, Lord. But yet, Lord, we come and we say thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you for your word. Lord, we just thank you and praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Once again, I know each and every one of us are going through something, and I'm not just going to single myself out and my family out. Of course, we are in need of great prayer, but all of us, we are all in need of prayer. And I know while I'm going through my stuff, I want you to know that I, am, I'm, I continue to pray for each and every one of you. I know when I come here, like even when I was here Friday, you know, trying to prepare this, this I'm sorry, yesterday, it was yesterday trying to prepare the sermon, I just walked over the pews and just, just prayed, you know, and I know the, the, uh, the good thing and the bad thing about, uh, about what we do is that we all sit in the same spots, so while I was walking, I was seeing you, <laughs> I was seeing you, I was praying for each and every one of you, now don't mix this up next week and be sitting all in different places and making me confused, but, you know, but, the, but I do want to let you know that I continually I continually pray for each and every one of you. So, um, you know, uh, this, this sermon that God has led me uh, for the, this next uh, few, few weeks until Resurrection Sunday, we're going to really be focusing on this prayer because prayer is powerful. And, and, and God listens to our prayers. He listens to the brokenhearted. That when we cry out, he says that not only does he listen, but he works he does he helps us so we're going to be talking about and pray and preaching on how jesus how jesus through these next few weeks how he prayed for his father he prayed to his father that his will be done and during this time especially in march going to resurrection sunday let's not forget why we're here let's not forget what he's done he means jesus christ that he could have stopped everything, but it was God's plan for our salvation to be reconciled with him. And that's what we needed. We needed Jesus to be obedient in his life and also through his death and resurrection. Let us all stand. And let us not forget on Friday, Friday, I know we have a minister Bridget, Elder Kim, and minister Tracy Tiller, they'll be preaching at, I don't, I forgot the name, the, the venue. I know where it is, but they'll be preaching 
part of the last seven words, and we would absolutely want to show our support for them. So it's, I think it starts at seven, and we should have it in our announcements. Um, it, it is on our uh, our website and also our Facebook, I'm not Facebook page, but our uh, church app. So let's show some support for them. Um, dear Heavenly Father, dear Father, Thank you for allowing your son Jesus to be the peace in the storm this, that, that we are facing, Father. Father, we just uh, want to um, give you all the glory. Everything that we do, everything we say, our actions, our thoughts, we want to make it to be in your glory. God, we thank you. We thank you for what you have done, what you're doing, what you're going to do for us. And I know I forgot to give the question of the day to meditate on, but it's how our lives are we concerned about our lives in giving you all the glory, Father? As we walk out of here and drive out of here, protect us. Give us traveling graces, especially when we arrive at home, but throughout this week, Father. Father, it is through the grace of your son, Jesus Christ, the love of you, the Father, and the communion with the Holy Spirit that we give you all the glory and honor and praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen.